let me begin week eight in Chinese. 準備好啦。That's in. That means in English. Are you ready? Okay. In Cantonese. 準備好啦。In Putonghua. 準備好啦。Very similar. Am I right? Okay. So it's always good to say that in Hong Kong. So you, you just say it once. It covers both. Okay. I want you to think. I want you to think. Is there one word that can capture? Is there one word that can capture the global challenge that multinationals have? That multinationals have. Is there one word? I want you to think about that. I don't know if I have the word for you right now, but one of those words is reputation. Write that down. Reputation. Maybe I shouldn't tell you that. Maybe I should ask you that. I should have asked you. Put your hand up if you're thinking about that word. Anyone? <laughs> huh? Reputation. What? Why do I say that? Why do I say reputation? What do you think? What do you think? Which one makes a little subplot change? Major. What do I, you know, that critical sleep moment before I go to sleep? The word that pops out is reputation. Why do I say that? I'm asking you a question. Why do you think? Why do you think? Up until now, we didn't talk about reputation. Now suddenly, boom. Can someone put their hand up and have a guess? Can I have one hand, please? So what's the question? Yeah. Why reputation? Yeah. Oh, now means because now we're talking about the big players. We're talking about the multinationals. We're not talking about little. Is it because uh, reputation is not that important for startups and small companies? It's more important for like the big players. Yes. Yes. Brand, brand. Multinationals have a brand. Reputation. Um, which group is studying environmental so social responsibility? You're doing it, right? Yeah. See, so you, you need to find the article on Puma. That happened. This happened about two years ago. The soccer, one of the soccer stars that they're sponsoring, the T-shirt just ripped so easily, and then suddenly, the global supply chain manager of Puma has got 30 emails within about three hours from all over the world. Fix this. I mean, how did this happen? On your watch, this is a factory problem, but now it's just affected. Our, we'll fix the reputation side. A global supply chain manager, you've got to make sure this doesn't happen again. Why did it happen? Is there any other stock affected? Are you with me here? All right? So why would Puma do that? Reputation. It's just, all right, so boom, one little thing can happen. Boom. Don't buy Puma. No, but that's it, right? That's it. It's so critical. Ah, all right. So... I want you to think about that. Okay, let's have a look. What are, what are these talking about? This, well, here are some examples of some of the trends that are going on. So, for example, New Balance, one of the big trends is compressing, compressing new product development from hours, from days to hours. How are they doing that? From this table over here. Any ideas? Have a guess. Oh, let me repeat. Okay. What these uh, New Balance and other factories are doing, one of the critical trends is they're trying to reduce the design time from weeks to days to hours. Yeah. Anyone? What about this group? 
Yeah, they send the designs. Yeah, but that's how they're doing it. But why do they, why do they have to go faster, faster, faster? Because of the competition, yes. Competition, disruption, okay. Then suddenly you've got fast fashion, which is basically fast environmental rubbish because people are throwing away more things because you've got to get the new design that's in the market. We understand that, but that's separate, all right. But you're right, who said they're sending people to the factory? Giorgio Armani are sending people to the factories in China, S. Oliver. I had interviewed with S. Oliver, they're sending people to the factory. Uh, group, if you want to listen to some of my interviews with Giamani, S. Oliver, you're most welcome to listen to them. Very, very interesting what they are doing about their factory management strategy. So why is it that we have email today we do everything on video, we do Skype calls, but you have multinationals sending people, putting them into it. Why are they doing that? Any ideas? Let me repeat, right? We're in the age of email, we've got the internet, we do everything, we can video everything, everything's re real time, right? But the multinationals are still sending, you know, you're my merchandise, I want, you're my design team, I want you to be on the other side of the planet tomorrow night. All right, here's some money, go. Personal relations. Uh, that, yes. Pardon? Quality control, partly, yes, and at the back here. It's a time thing, yes. Because then I want you to think about when the design, they'll come up with a sample and then, they, then they'll give it to the factory manager and then they'll run it through the machines and then make a sample. Oh, we don't like that. Can you change it again? But when you go on through the email, you take a photo of it and send it back. Or even if you FedEx the whole sample and it goes back to Italy, then they check, no, we don't like that. Then we've got to make some changes in Italy. Oh, then put it on a plane, send it back to the factory. It just takes triple quadruple the time. So isn't that interesting? We've got internet, but multinationals are sending their own people to the factory. So the internet hasn't replaced good old design team and factory. In other words, location matters. Interesting, isn't it? All right, VF. You know about VF because in the first week I told you all about VF, the largest manufacturer of jeans in the world. Mm. And remember, what was the big challenge? Can you remember? Wow, very good. Very, yes, the cost of time. Not the cost of materials, not the cost of supply, the cost of time. Isn't that interesting? Have you ever thought about that? What's the cost of time to you? Who in here has the most expensive cost of time? Would anyone like to put their hand up and say that, well, my time is most expensive and more expensive than everyone else? Oh, we have one hand at the back here. Okay, all right. Okay. The cost of time. Remember, an example was they do only five pop variety made in Mexico. Remember, we're talking about multinationals tonight. Multinationals, okay? All right, so I'm just telling you what here are the trends. They do their five pocket variety in Mexico, boom. Just, we just, all we have to do is tell the factory, oh, we want 10,000 units next week, boom. Push the button, go, right? But for the designs, they don't send their latest designs to Mexico because it takes too long to train people, they're not as skilled. So they send it all the way to China where they got more skilled personnel and then they train them and then they work with the higher designs with them. But those more high design genes have to come all the way back to the American market. Whereas the ones out of the Mexico factory can be in the American market within 24 hours. And you know, you think about that, you know, what's the difference? It's the time, it just takes longer to send it to China and then all the way back. You with me? And they're just they're always thinking about it. Cost of time, very interesting. Okay, that VF, red ring. Oh, this one, this is so interesting. I haven't told you about this one. 
red ring, I want you to red, red ring, okay? All right, they make shoes, but it's amazing. This is called vertical integration, and they're kind of like a, they're like a middle person. And you go to them and say, oh, I want to do a new shoe design. And this middle person is more than a middle person because the middle person actually owns the factories. They own the tanneries. It's sort of like a consortium. It's not like they just take their little cut and pass it onto the factory. All right, you're in the shoe business. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. So my interview with, with a guy from Weave Consulting, very interesting interview. He was telling me all about how they make money. And this is based in China, Red Wing Shoes. And they equity ownership, IP protection, equity ownership of the factory and tanneries. They sort of just like vertically own everything. Like it's just amazing. Okay, so that's, that's another trend out there. Okay, all right. This is much more of a, oh, if I teach an IT course or accounting, then we're going to talk about, okay, how do they manage the cost management, all right? So we don't want to go into too much detail with this, only to tell you that there are different levels of focus depending on how strategic a certain item is in the supply chain. But here is a challenge. If we talk about Zara, H&M, because in some ways, remember, I'm trying to chunk in your presentation up. They chunk the year up into like 15 modules. And every module is a new design. It's a new outfit. 15 times a year. Not once a month. It's more than once a month. And when they do that, then this puts pressure on having joint location of design team with the factory so things can go faster, 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 faster. Or they use something like tech packer so then they can speed up the communications. So a tech pack, technical word, is a term in the fashion industry where we put a code to every little thing on apparel. You know, the button has a code, this has a code, this has a code. And so as a designer, you tell the factory, well, I want the new design has a 56 for here, 45 for here, 33 for that, 34 for that. Like it's all, everything standardized. You put all the standardized features together and then suddenly you've got the new item. So that's called a tech pack. A tech pack is the bunch of codes that represents a design. There's a startup in Hong Kong that creates the software that enabled this to be done. And guess what the name of the startup is? Tech Packer, yes, Tech Packer. And I interviewed that startup, and it's just so interesting. Like their business model is software as a service. Okay, so you, all right. Okay, that's the big thing there. All right, so here is if we go to the big idea reputation. Reputation, part of reputation, and then you are trying to balance that with cost. We're trying to balance that with time. Please do not confuse this with what you would learn in a decision sciences course. In a decision sciences course, when you talk about project management, we are balancing cost, Time. What's this one? Scope. And in the middle, quality. All right. When we talk to the consultants like McKinsey, Boston Consulting Group, and the Big Four, when they talk about algorithms for making supply chains more efficient for these multinationals, they talk about this notion of quality, cost, and time as a trade-off. You can only have two. You cannot have all three. You want it faster, high quality, then it's going to cost you more. You want it cheaper, fast, quality is going to be low. Ah, 
All right? So, okay, here's the thing. Don't get confused, okay? In some ways, this is kind of like a supply chain management idea. This comes from the project management literature. There's not much difference between them. In some ways, scope is probably critical too, because that's how much you want to order. By HTC, we're making 30 million smartphones in 2012. So in any order from a supplier, component supplier, was going to be, oh, next week, can you deliver us 1.2 million transistors, please? Not like 1,000, like scope was big. You with me here, right? So it's, when we talk about here, oh yeah, well, if you only want one sample, of course, we can do it very fast, cheap, you with me? But if you want 10,000, then you've got to do some trading off. Ah, okay. So uh, be flexible here in, you'll see different textbooks where they talk about different trade-offs with that. One is coming more from decision sciences, one more from supply chain management. So what, what, this is summarizing some of the interviews that I had with S. Oliver, virtual design teams sending designers across to the factory. What's H&M doing? Ah, here's another thing you need to think about. Oh, why am I just time, cost, quality? Ah, what's another issue that a multinational would have that we need to think about? Did you all get this down? This is your code for tonight. Don't forget, write that down. All right. Before I rub it off. All right. All right. Let me just put reputation. Let's just put time here. All right. Time is important. Here, here, here's, here's another thing you need to think about. What about incentives? All right. Incentives. Like, I want you to think about it. If you're a startup and you're working with a supplier, well, oh, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Supplier, look, you know, we're a startup, can you help us? You know, when we get bigger, we're going to be your best customer. You know, the, you can understand the conversation's going to be like that. With a multinational, well, you don't have to beg to the supplier, you're with me here. But at the same time, you still need to be aware of what is the real supplier's interest in working with you? Because remember, they can have different strategies. They work with you. Why? Because they're going to copy things from you. Well, they work for you. They're not worried about doing best quality. They just want to copy things from you. They don't care if they're not a supplier of you in two years' time. But for a multinational, you don't want the supplier to think like that. So you need to think about what is the supplier's incentive. You need to keep the supplier interested in you and make sure the supplier is not just thinking about what they can get from you in terms of design so they make profits in other markets. Ah, so what can you do? Well, you need to have incentives. So how do you provide incentives? Well, okay, let me uh, pause, pause. Okay, may I have your attention, please? Talking a lot here. Pause, I'm gonna stop talking and ask you a question. Are you ready? Okay, okay. How can we incentivize suppliers? I've, I've just made a point that this is very, very important for multinationals. More important than a startup. Because multinationals depend on large volumes from suppliers. But also with those large volumes, you need to make sure that the supplier keeps up the quality because there's quality fade over time. And you say, well, a small buyer has that problem too. No, 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 the small buyer doesn't have a reputational problem if something goes wrong. The multinational does. You with me here? So therefore, the incentives is more important for the multinational. You with me with my logic here? All right. So then the question is, all right. So how do we create incentives for the multinational? Oh, how does the multinational create incentive for the supplier? Uh, you tell me some plans about the future. If all goes well, in two years we'll do this. Three years we'll do this. Something like that. Yes. Yeah. All right. So you give them a future roadmap. HTC does that. You have a roadmap for the future, correct? What else? Some suggestions on Ah, okay, so you're actually, then we call about direct involvement with the supplier in actually helping them to improve. Okay, that's good, okay. So you're working with a supplier. Um, yep. Yes, at the back. 
then we can set up a certain fixed price at this quantity that we supply to this company. Are you talking about? Mm. Ah, okay, so that's like a future roadmap that you're giving. Okay, so good. Okay, so let's just close off this minute of interaction. All right, give you an idea for when you're doing the presenting. All right, all right. This is what I want you to think about what H&M do. H&M have a supplier management system. Do you all know H&M? Yes, Jim. Okay, good. So they have silver, gold, and platinum. What does that mean? Ah. Suppliers that go to platinum have really, really close interactions with H&M. H&M share with the platinum suppliers, oh, here's our three-year roadmap. But for the silver suppliers, oh, here is our one-year roadmap. Are you with me? And so there's an incentive for a supplier to go to gold or go to platinum. Why? Because they get closer and closer to H&M. And they get closer and closer to future opportunities. They get closer and closer to the improvement opportunities. Ah. Well, that's what H&M do that, all right? Uh, Puma is doing that, Ikea does that too. Okay, so here are big brands. This is how they incentive, by staging, staging. So put that down. The big incentive, it's not about giving a commission. It's not about pay an extra price. It's about staging the supplies. It's like creating, how many, you're in a loyalty program for an airline. Same idea. Sort of like a supplier loyalty program. Okay, those loyalty programs only work if you know that the program you have that loyalty with has good reputation, has a brand, they're going to be around, and you know that there are real benefits for staying where you are or going to the next level. Okay, multinationals can do that, SMEs cannot do that, startups cannot do that. Ah, that's the big difference. Okay, so staging, all right. Okay, the, so that's IKEA, communication, collaboration, and compliance. Uh, amazing. Interestingly, most of IKEA's factories around the world are in which country? China. Okay, China. Okay. It is interesting, like, everything ships from China to Europe, ships from China to USA for IKEA. But, and they manage China very, very well. It's amazing. They've been doing that for the last twin decades, few decades. So here is my summary, and this was in the KPMG report, of my observations of multinationals' best practice models. So what does it mean? Okay. The big thing, this is, this is critical for the efficiency of the supply chain. So E for efficiency here, okay? This is critical here, okay? This is critical for, what do you think? What do you think this is critical for, the top part? Reputation, ah, okay, critical. Ah, and the one at the bottom, is critical for for helping to it's helping the supply to become more profitable efficient over time ah, okay so I, this is my summary of interviewing the H&M the IKEA Giorgio Armani S Oliver many other multinational brands on that hmm Mm. Okay, let's have a break for a moment. Um, all right. So what do they do? What do you do when you have a problem like that? You've got to deal with it. So what does HTC? Knock on Samsung's door, you've got to give us more, more, more. You can't do that. They're already, you know, Samsung's a big player. You cannot just, Samsung's not just going to give what HTC want. Uh, so what did HCC do? They went to Sony. Sony, we need to supply of screens. Can you help us? And what did Sony say? Yes, no problem. We do it. That's what they did. Right? But since then, they multi-source most of the things. Because when you don't multi-source, you can get into trouble. You get into big, big trouble. <clears throat> so many suppliers have flexibility. Many teams to manage the complexity. 
And you'll find out from the groups tonight, as they're presenting, they will show you what the complexity is all about. And they have extensive performance measurement systems to measure the supplies. You'll find out that tonight from the presentations. And lots of monitoring and cost controls. Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, let's skip over that because the groups are going to talk about this tonight. Okay. They have a supplier development process. So, for example, if a supplier goes down to, is relegated and they've been a bad supplier, rather than, we're going to talk about that in the group's presentations, but here's some quotes from talking with the COO of HTC. If we have a probation of six months, six months later, we will audit again. We will assign someone to visit the factory. We have a guide to tell them how to improve their system, and they will follow TDQSC. One year, if they still rank to C, we'll remove from our list both penalty and rewards. Supposedly our score, 70 points is greater C, but right even you've got A grade or B grade, but equality is less than 70, you should be downgraded to C. Wow, all right, our group's going to talk about that tonight. Ah, all right. The other group's going to talk about that. So, what am I going to talk about? I'm just going to give you a brief overview of other things, ways in which HDC and the big electronics brand names manage their suppliers in the next three minutes and then that's all I'm going to do. So have, have your attention please. Okay, they have close location of engineering managers. How many of you have heard of field application engineering? In other words, sending engineers into the field. Ah. And some of the best salesmen or the purchasing managers are those of engineering background because they know the product inside out, especially if you're on sales. If you have an engineering background, it's much easier to sell. Who are you selling to? Most often you're selling to engineers because if you're trying to sell to a procurement team and they have engineers on their team, they're gonna be asking lots of technical questions. So as a salesperson, you need to have that technical knowledge of the product you are selling. Ah. All right, cost leadership measure. I've seen that used by HTC on Lighton. And Lighton, how many of you have heard of Lighton? Some of you old as me will know that is Lighton. They make the little light that picks up the data from a CD drive. You know on a CD drive you've got a little light that picks up the data. Do, do you know what a CD is? A right, long time ago I know. And, uh, so they used to make that. So Lighton, they make the LED light that picks up the data. Right? So they're a major supplier to HTC. So we interviewed Lighton. And they were telling us, oh, we use a scorecard on our suppliers. So here is a supplier of HTC using the same measurement system on their suppliers. It's not just at the first tier, it's at second tier suppliers are using scorecards too. Ah, buyer power and information sharing. Hmm. More about this next week because Apple is a great example of that. Hmm. And dial up quality control to win concessions. We'll talk more about that next week. But I want to give you one little example. I want you to think about, I want you to think about one little example. And here it is. I just want to, and the principle is called A I A, not AI. The principle is IA. And what does that mean? It means this is called information asymmetry. That is the supply knows something that you don't know. So how do you manage that? Ah, well. One of the big communications that takes place in engineered related supply chains, like electronics. Remember, textiles is not an engineering related supply chain. There's a lot more subjectivity involved in specs and things like that. But in electronics, it's very, very technical. Okay, so how does a supplier hide information from a buyer? Well, the buyer may ask a question, oh, Mr. Supplier, oh, last month, tell me about your yields. And here's a question for you, class. Think about it. The buyer comes to you, you are a supplier. And your yields are at, maybe, your yield is at 80%. Okay, fine. All right, so, what are you going to tell the buyer? What are you going to tell your buyer? If you want to hide information from the buyer, 
if you want to hide information, what are you going to do? So let me go around from table to table and you tell me. You, there's only three choices, it's like multiple choice. So get you ready for the quiz here, all right? A, going to be greater than 80%. B, equal. C, less than. If you want to follow a strategy where you want to hide information and keep an advantage with the buyer. Remember, this is in an industry where on average every three months costs down by 5%. Remember, this is the last big challenge I give to you and then the groups will be presenting. And then next week we will continue on with this dialogue about how buyers are managing their suppliers. But this is the last big challenge well, I'll leave you with here. Okay. Let's go around. Multiple choice. Quiz time. Okay, are you ready? All right, so from this table, you're a supplier, what is your strategy? The buyer asks you, oh, in the last month, what is your yield? By the way, what it yield means, yield means that uh, maybe you put a, you put 100% in and out comes 80%. All right, 100% of whatever, you know, materials, labor, into the machinery. You should be able to make 100%, but 80% comes out and 20% is reject. All right, is there a strategy in there where suppliers can hide information from the buyer which is advantageous to the supplier? That's the question. Let me repeat. Is there a strategy here where you can hide information from the buyer that puts you, the supplier, in an advantageous position. Now remember, every month the buyer is going to ask you, oh, remember last week we did a computational, you know, the, we did the computation of how much to accept, a separable quality limit, you remember? Okay, oh, this is a quantitative part for this week, okay? So here's, this, what's the strategy? Hence, um, A, B, or C. All right, someone for C, what's the strategy? B, are you sure? It's a group. B, all right. So group over, this table over here, want to be honest? Okay, uh, strategy. Hmm? C, strategy. Strategy. So the answer is, so why? why? Why is the strategy to tell the buyer that your yield is less than what it really is? Okay, so you're, prepared, you're, you're building slack into the expectations of the buyer in future negotiations, right? Okay, good. All right, you got the idea, right? So that's a real strategy that suppliers do. Ah, so if... So it looks like you're wise to that strategy and you're thinking, no, I'm kind of, you really haven't tricked us this week. Okay, fine, all right. So if that's a strategy, now you want to think about your HDC and you know that that strategy works, so what do you do? Ah. You know that suppliers are going to lie on the yields, if they can. They're always going to tell you lower than what expected. a good strategy. How do you do that? HTC, one way, can we, would anyone like to offer a suggestion? To compare with another sector. Yeah, you're very good. Okay, because HTC have many suppliers, multi-sourcing, can compare one supplier off another one. We'll talk more about that next week. Huh? How else? So number one is, um, like RPE, Relative performance evaluation, or you, you, you actually use in benchmarking, right? Another one is what Apple does to a more extent next week is monitoring. They just have people at the factory monitoring. Another strategy next week we we'll talk about is VI, vertical integration. That is, what is the yield component of? It's input, output divided by input. Is that right? Output divided by input. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, 80 out, 100 in. Ah, all right. What if I know the input, then you cannot lie to me. So as a big buyer, how do I know the inputs of the supplier? Who do I go and talk to? 
the supplier supplier. But what if the supplier supplier lies to me? What do I do then? Uh, no, we own the supplier supplier. We control the supplier supplier. Ah, do they do that? Yes, yeah, some companies do that. Would you like to have a guess who does that? You're right. More about that next week. Okay. All right. So I just want you to think about the exciting stuff. Not next week, week after. We, we talk about what Apple does. You can see that. Wow, this is. Put your hand up if you front. This is interesting. This is like this is. This is about managing people that lie to you. You know, you're expecting them to have a strategy which really is not in your best interest. So how do you manage that when you don't have all the information?